otherwise on SAFM. Right, you're listening to Otherwise Talking Women here on SAFM. The traditional courts bill has come under heavy criticism recently uh, as it poses a serious threat to the rights of people living in rural areas and women specifically. Today we're joined by Suzani Ngobani, who she's, she's the founder and leader of the Rural, rural Women's Movement, and Vilmeen Wickham, who is an attorney in the Constitutional Lit- Litigation Unit of the Legal Resources Centre, to discuss the implications of the bill for women across South Africa. Suzani Vilmeen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Suzani, are you there? And thank you for having us in your studio. Absolute pleasure. I think, Vilmeen, let's, let's start with you. Um, could you give us a brief background of the traditional courts bill? So the traditional courts bill is an attempt of, by the legislature to s- regulate traditional courts in South Africa in terms of statute. So it's important to know that this bill does not create traditional courts. They're functioning across South Africa. But currently they're still being regulated in terms of the Black Administration Act of 1927, which clearly is a, an act that we don't mm-hmm. want on the law books anymore. And because that, bill needs to be, that act needs to be repealed, this bill came in to replace it. Okay. And it it hasn't been passed yet. It's still under... um, No. So what happened recently was that um, it was decided that the provinces had to um, consult and vote on the bill. And so provincial hearings were held across the country. And last week in Parliament, the provinces came with their mandates on the bill and something unprecedented happened. Um, Four of the provinces voted against the bill, which has never happened before and actually meant that the bill should not have been passed. Um, Unfortunately, the select committee um, of the uh, NCOP, the the National Council of Provinces, Mm -hmm. decided to delay the process further um, to have more consultations, perhaps because they were caught unawares by something this unprecedented happening. Um, Okay, right. I want to get back to the public hearings a little bit later, but Suzani, maybe you can give us an idea of what the actual issues facing the women that you work with, um, with your rural rural women's movement, in light of customary law as it stands now. Uh, In in most situations, the traditional courts are not accessible to ordinary women like me. Uh, I will make an example of uh, a grandmother who is staying alone, she reported a case of her garden being constantly destroyed by a head of cattle from a neighboring uh, community of Mangwini at Utugela district. In court, her case could not be taken because she was not represented by a male relative. She was sent away and uh, the chief demanded that be represented by a male person. And because she is staying alone, she does not have a male person, she hasn't been able to go back to court, and uh, she has stopped growing food in her, in her garden as a supplement for her social grant that she receives from the government every month. And um, uh, another friend of ours who is also at Tutugela district, went to a, a local a traditional leader to report that her 16-year-old grade 8 school girl was abducted. And uh, the traditional leader informed her that she needs to wait to hear back from her daughter. He didn't take the case seriously. He didn't even try to call the police. On her way back from home, she was confronted by a group of local men accusing her of reporting the matter to a traditional leader without informing them. She was so intimidated. She's a widow. She didn't have anybody to turn to. And this group of men colluded with her maritime male relatives, and they accepted Ilobolo, and her daughter is now married to her rapist and has a baby with him. So where is the Mm. traditional law Mm. in terms of women's rights? And and how is the bill uh, supposed to be addressing these concerns or these issues that are arising? What is the bill's 
part to play here and where is it falling down as well? I think for me, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, um, what Sazani is mentioning, what this what this bill could have done was to to do more to ensure that women's rights are protected in terms of traditional courts because um, while, you know, 21 million people in South Africa still regulate their lives in terms of customary law, the majority of them women, um, and for many of them, this is a very important aspect of their life mm. and traditional courts do um, provide um, access to justice at many levels. What this bill does, however, um, is... It does very, very little to ensure that women um, can represent themselves or even appear in the traditional courts bill, uh, in the traditional courts, because um, it provides that uh, women can be presented by men in terms of custom, and the bill uh, almost amusingly says, and men can be represented by women also in terms of custom. Now we know that that doesn't happen anywhere in South Africa, so the bill really, in a formal way, tries to pretend to protect the rights of women, but in practice that will certainly not happen. Right, you're listening to Otherwise uh, Talking Women here on SAFM, and we're talking the traditional courts bill today and uh, the fact that it's come under heavy criticism recently, posing a, a serious threat to the rights of people living in rural areas and women specifically. I have Suzani Ngubani, who's the founder and leader of the Rural Women's Movement, and Vilmin uh, Wickham, who's a, an attorney at the Constitutional Lit Litigation Unit of the Legal Resources Center. And Vilmin was just saying about um, how the representation works in the bill as well and I wanted to ask how was the bill developed and what was women's part to play in that? Well that's certainly one of the main issues that we have with the bill. The bill by, by the admission of the Department of Justice the bill was developed in consultation with the traditional leaders only um, and that's perhaps reflected in the content of the bill because it makes the senior traditional leader or the chief the only um, person with a power of decision making in these traditional courts. So he is the tra judicial officer, um, whereas in traditional courts, um, actually on the ground, what happens is that um, the chief is supported by various, um, by a council or a council of elders, and these courts happen at various different levels, headmen and family levels. Um, what the bill then does by only giving the chief the power of decision making is by in, you know, really excluding women completely from the composition of the court, which is not customary um, because it's a single person, but in customary law that we know that women uh, generally do not have voices in traditional courts. And what this bill should have done is ensure that women actually have voices. Absolutely. And um, Cezani, maybe you can answer this question. The traditional courts, do they serve as a primary access to justice for many women? Not at all. Okay. Uh, we, we, we know stories of women who were shouted down uh, in the courts and who were not even able to enter the premises only because they are mourning the loss of their, of their husbands. Okay. Uh, not long ago, in February, as a province, we elected and selected the traditional councils according to the traditional leadership and governance framework act of 2007 which provides that a traditional leader should select 60 percent of the council and the communities should select 40 percent and 30 percent of those should be women the the bill does not talk to the functions and powers or recognized given the role played by these traditional councils or its, uh, or, or its councillors in customary dispute resolution process in terms of the traditional court speed. It only speaks of courts as only consisting of senior traditional leader, typically male, and presiding officer, and possibly a forum of community leaders. And this does not create a space for women's uh, access to justice in these traditional courts. And how does that election process uh, actually work? Is it open for everybody when, when they're electing traditional leaders? In some areas, uh, okay. rural women did not even know that there, there were elections taking place in their areas. And the, 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 the Framework Act provides that the traditional leader should select 60% of the, of the council members. 
And out of that 60%, we know traditional leaders who have their mothers, their daughters, their wives sitting in those traditional councils as, as members. You want to yes, comment? I just wanted to jump in and say we must just distinguish between the election of traditional councils mm-hmm. and traditional leaders because traditional leaders are not elected. They, you know, they're they appointed in terms of custom. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then the council, you know, 60% of the council is again um, chosen by the traditional leader who is unelected and then 40% only um, get elected by the community. And 30% of it should be women. That's right. Meaning that the, the community has only got 40%. Sure. And is this included in the bill? No, this is included in the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, which okay. Suzani mentioned of 2003. Mm. But it is very important that this bill builds on the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act. And what that act did was to entrench the apartheid boundaries of, that was created in 1951 of traditional communities in South Africa. So one of the main problems of this bill is that many people live with, um, inside boundaries of traditional communities and under chiefs whom they don't recognize, whom they found whom they find illegitimate. And now this bill gives those very illegitimate chiefs extraordinary powers as judicial officers um, to call people before their courts. If you don't go, it's a criminal offense. So communities really have no way to assert um, their own voices to say, well, this chief that's, that's been placed over me, I don't recognize him, I don't belong to him, I have my own chief, or I, d- I choose not to have a chief. That, those options are just completely closed off by this bill. Okay, and, and, and to mm, add, mm. some of these two, uh, of these chiefs or traditional leaders were imposed by the by the apartheid regime, and yeah. not so many people recognize them as their chiefs. And this is not being addressed in the bill, and that's the point. It's not being addressed yeah. in the mm. bill. In fact, it's being entrenched. Yeah. Entrenched. So, so you mentioned that there has been public hearings this this month, uh, and it's been nationwide. Am I right? Yes, in every province. Okay. And how did they how did they work? What were, what were their um, what was their function, and and how did it actually roll out? Well, Suzani can certainly talk about her mm. personal experience because I know that she she had some interesting experiences. But the point of these hearings were really for the provincial legislators to go out and hear people's opinion about the bill and that opinion should have informed their own position on the bill. Um, these hearings were were significantly flawed in many ways. I mean, the, because the chiefs were the ones involved in drafting the bill, these hearings should have, you know, emphasized the voices of ordinary people and in particular women. Um, but the, the most of the hearings failed dismally in doing this. You know, chiefs um, showed up um, in big numbers, and people find that very intimidating. Um, and women, in particular, for a woman to stand up in front of a chief and and uh, you know go against him is a very very difficult thing to do. And these hearings did very little um, to to ameliorate those kind of power imbalances. And people were simply not educated about the bill. Mm-hmm. Suzani, what was your experience of those public hearings? Uh, I would agree with my colleague that they were flawed. Mm. Um, I will start with the public education uh, in uh, Pochettin. There, I would ex- estimate that more than 400 uh, chiefs were, were there. And as, as women, we were only representing about 25 five people. And one of the prominent uh, chiefs, announced that he did not expect us and that he on he, he invited he only invited chiefs and the headmen and he doesn't know what we are doing here. He even mentioned that during the public hearings we must not attend the, the public hearing. We were shouted down when we were trying to speak. They were shouting uh, at us and they were even asking questions like, is she a chief? Is she a head woman? That was uh, kind of intimidating. At Stenga, I was shouted down by one of the prominent uh, traditional leader who is the member of the legislature, I was made to believe. He was complaining that 
I spoke in Pochefstein, and now I am trying to speak again in uh, at Stenga, at the public hearing in Stenga. And he was quite angry with me. And that on its own was, was not called for, and mm. yeah, it, it embarrassed me. Mm. And it seems it seems that what's going on with this bill and you know in and around it as well is it's in tension with our constitution really. Yes, I mean that's that's certainly the case. Um, I just want to emphasise before we um, mm. um, finish with the public hearings that despite all these incredible difficulties that communities face, they were unbelievably brave, and in almost every hearing, if not every hearing, communities stood up and made their voices heard. And I mean that is why. Um, four provinces actually heard all these complaints and actually went um, to Parliament last week with the intention of voting against the bill. So, mm. I mean, we, one must say that mm. this was an extraordinary effort by rural communities and um, and a great victory what happened in Parliament last week. Um, with regards to the constitutionality, there are certainly many aspects of this bill that that. that cannot um, withstand constitutional muster. We are certain of it. And the pity is that even the Department of Justice, even Minister Khadebe, um, has has acknowledged that the bill in the current form is not constitutional. The problem is that they're not giving us a new version of the bill. They're forcing us to continue debating this clearly unconstitutional version of the bill, which is simply unfair. Um, and we're trying to put pressure on Parliament to, to do the right thing and withdraw this bill and start this process afresh. Suzani, do you have a comment there? Yeah, as, uh, as the rural women's movement, we are calling for this bill to be scrapped mm. and a brand new bill uh, which, in, which is informed by the experiences of the rural people, particularly rural women, should be formulated. And just going back to the public hearings, I think, because what you said was it is important that the voices of the people are actually heard. Mm. So the, the, uh, the outcome of those public hearings, it means that four uh, legislators voted against yes. it. So the, the status of it now... Can we clarify? Yes, that? well, that <laughs> it's not clear to anyone. As I said, um, the provinces came last week, Wednesday, to Parliament with mm. their mandates. Um, but the um, the portfolio committee, who were meant to to consider these mandates, refused to do so and even refused um, to discuss the substance of the bill. Um, they knew, of course, as we all did, that four provinces voted against it, mm. um, but they did want, not want to deal with it. And, and uh, what they then did was decide to delay the process and the committee themselves to go out and hold further hearings. Now, we are disputing the constitutionality of that process. We believe the constitution provides that they, were, they had to have um, considered the provincial mandate mandates mm. and we are uh, currently seeking further legal opinion on it and we're, we're waiting to see what the speaker of the NCOP does. And why is there actually resistance from the legislator to scrap the bill? What are they connecting with there? And you're smiling well, that, you. That's a difficult question yeah. um, to answer. I mean, for one, I think it was completely unexpected for everybody um, that, you know, that four provinces would vote against it and one Mpumalanga refused to vote actually and said they needed more time. Um, when we can speculate on why why they are so keen on getting this bill through, I think there's there's a lot of power um, um, amongst the chiefs, uh, political power and clout, and we can't deny it. Um, and um, that might be part of the reason why there's why there, there's reluctance to actually throw this bill away. But at the moment, it's really making it impossible um, for rural communities to have a sensible discussion on the bill, um, given that even the minister has rejected it, um, and now all the provinces, and yet. Um, the department or whoever is going to draft a new bill, we don't know who. Mm. Um, they're just refusing to start the process of a new bill. And actually, all, all this fruitful discussion of rural communities, you know, when mm. this process has given rural communities the chance to speak about the things way beyond the bill, the things that they're still suffering from because of the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act and mm. because of the chiefly powers. Um, and that, the legislature should really use that opportunity um, to, to, to draft a, a fresh bill, a mm. new bill. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Cezani? 
and uh, and one of those um, uh, is the imposed levies. Mm. Mm. That one is a, is a very big issue in the rural areas. Um, I will make example of uh, of what is happening at Zululand District. For one to be allocated land, one has to pay one thousand five hundred rand, and people are only. Uh, issued receipts for, for 200 rand. I know that the, the bill is saying there will be a trust where all the monies would be, would be sent to and that the traditional authorities would have all their books audited. But how does one auditor a situation where people pay 1,500 rand and be issued a, a receipt for 200 rand? Land is illegally sold here in Guazulu Natal for between 250 to 7,000 rand. And some people do not even have receipts for those, uh, those amounts they are paying to be allocated land. Hmm. So, so how is the bill going to deal with this? I know hmm. that some of the traditional leaders are saying, Oh, there is a section in the bill which allows people to report these matters to the minister. Which ordinary woman uh, like me mm. would approach the minister and report a matter against her traditional leader? So you... Taking into consideration the kind of intimidation mm. that is there in the rural areas. Mm. Suzani, um, just to wrap up, where can people find out more information or connect with the rural women's movement? We are currently based on 38 Valley Road, hmm. Sikau Lake in Durban. And okay. our phone number is 031-579-4559. Or double five nine, and Vilmin, where can people find out more information from the Legal Resources Centre? And uh, so our website is www.lrc.org.za, um, and then there's a wonderful resource for all information on yes. the website of the Law, Race, and Gender Unit of the University of Cape Town. So I don't have their website in my head, but if people okay. Google them, th there's a wealth of information on the bill there. Well, thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Um, I think that we, uh, we will revisit the issue, and I hope that your work continues to lend strength to, uh, to working against the bill as well. And thank you for joining us thank again. You. We thank thank you. you for having us. Thank you, Suzani. Thank you, Vilmin. Well, that was Suzani Ngobani. She's the founder and leader for the Rural, rural Women's Movement, and Vilmin Wickham, who is an attorney in the Constitutional Litigation Unit of the Legal Resources Center. And you can visit their website at lrc.org.za. Org.za. 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 Org.